So a lot of people that haven't sorted out the step two CS, we have to answer some questions. And for the guys that are here that have, you know, been that are already past that stage, it's important to be able to take some of that information and share with people as much as you can. Um, obviously, there, there are several platforms people can find this information, especially on the ECFMD website on the US in the Step Two CS website, as well. So if you if you have a problem with Step Two CS, if you haven't if you haven't um, done and passed Step Two CS, so I think this part is mostly for you. Um, the second question is, are you able to get ECFMD certification without Step 2 CS? The answer is yes. Like I said, um, the pathways, there's so many of, there's about five of them actually. Um, first one is, are you already licensed to practice medicine in another country? Uh, for those of you who might have gotten licensed in another country, um, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's in the Caribbean, whether it's in Jamaica, or whatever country, um, that you have license to practice this much, that is one pathway you can definitely use. Uh, the second pathway is patient, uh, people who have already passed a standardized clinical skills exam for medical licensure. This one is a bit more specified because they're talking about countries that have some form of significant uh, similarity with the US standards. So you will be talking about Canadian uh, um, clinical skills exam. I think the GME exams in England are also part of this. So if you've passed any of those ones, you can then, you can prove that you have um, the clinical capabilities and be able to be, be eligible for ECFMG certification. So where you don't necessarily have to do um, your, your USMLE step to CS before getting that certification. The, the third pathway is medical school. If your medical school is accredited by an agency recognized by the World, Federal, World Federation for Medical Education, I think by, by and large, most schools are recognized under this. But I have to say, some schools, especially schools um, in the Caribbean, might have an issue with that. So there's two pathways for somebody from that kind of a school where if you've already done the step two CS, then you're good to go. You get your CFMG certificate. You don't have to worry about anything. But if you haven't done your step two CS, you'd be worried about actually getting that certification, which one of the major ways is to make sure that your school has some contingency plan, whether they're figuring out their accreditation, probably it's in process. You have to call your school to make sure that if you go to the US uh, ECFMG website or you go to the WFME website, it lists all of the agencies that they have given authorization to, to be able to accredit schools. So you have to make sure that whatever agency they've highlighted for the country of your school is, you know, uh, 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 as actually accredited your school. I think it's called FAFSA or something like that. Federal Student Loan Program. So if your school already participates in this, then you're good to go. You reach out to ECFMG and you should be able to get your certificate. Um, the fifth um, pathway is medical schools that have joint degrees with um, American schools. So you have, I think, there's a school in Singapore, National University of Singapore, and I believe there is uh, another school in Qatar that have joint degrees, you know, given by American schools. So those kind of schools are good to go and you don't have to worry about anything. So those are all the pathways, but are, is that enough? No. The ECFMG has mandated that for everyone who's going to be eligible for these pathways should take an English proficiency exam. And the major example of that is TOEFL. I don't know if they are allowing IELTS as, as an example, but right now TOEFL is what I know. And they, they're still yet to finalize what the satisfactory score on those exams are. They're just saying you have to have a satisfactory score because you have to remember for the step two CS, there's different components of the exam. Obviously, there's a clinical assessment and blah, blah, blah. And then there's parts that test your English proficiency. So if they're saying that of all of these pathways you qualify, you, they can somewhat prove your clinical proficiency from any of these pathways. The second thing is to then say, are you proficient in English? And they're not going based on what your country of citizenship is. I'm from Nigeria, for example, and you know, our official language is English, but if I finish from a Nigerian school, or if I'm a citizen of Nigeria, I still have to take that exam. You still have to show something that says you're proficient in English that is uh, useful enough to be able to help patients. Um, so TOEFL is definitely going to be considered. Um, there are other 
eligibility that is required for you to be able to use those pathways. So one of them is you, you don't, you haven't already passed step two CS, meaning if you've passed step two CS, you're good to go. You don't need, you don't need any of these pathways. You are not barred from ECFMB from pursuing, pursuing certification. There's some uh, students, some medical students or some medical professionals that have an issue with ECFMG, whether it's falsification of documentation or whatnot, that they've been barred from taking any of the exams. So if that is the case, then there is a problem there. If you're, if you're, you know, affected like that, then you most likely have to reach out to ECFMG to make sure that they remedy that. The third thing is, um, are you are you made to make sure that you're not barred from USMLE or taking any particular uh, uh, step uh, of the USMLE? And if that is the case, you most likely want to reach out to them and see what can be done. And you, they they expect that you have not filled the USMLE step or step component, whether it's step one, step two CK, or step two CS two or more times. So if somebody has failed once, you're not affected, you're still good to go. But if you have failed it two or more times, then there's an issue, you know, sadly. Um, and then finally, they, they expect that you have taken or been registered for any USMLE uh, 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 since January 1 uh, of 2018. So these are the things that make you able to use those pathways and you need to go through uh, these points one after the other to make sure, you know, wh whatever applies to you. Now, moving forward, if you've clarified all of that, you know, you have to then ask what, what then? And really is back into this, the, the specifics of what it takes to be able to apply for the match. And we'll go through the timeline and use the timeline to be able to, you know, explain further. So your best chance of getting the most amount of interviews for for uh, uh, for residency is to submit early. I'm not saying certain factors won't still affect who they give interviews or not, but you know, barring anything, you putting your application in there early will improve your chances of getting noticed and getting considered uh, for interviews. I know a lot of people don't talk about this, but I think it's something people have to be very very. Um, um, conscious about. So you want to get everything ready on time. And what usually happens is this, right? Maybe somebody hasn't taken their USMLE Step 2 CK and the results don't come out on time, or they haven't taken their Step 2 CS, or the results don't come out on time, and it delays their application. I've seen students where, you know, they had probably 250s and some really impressive scores that don't get the amount of interviews that they should get because they, they, they applied late. You get what I mean? So it's important to understand that get all of the things you need to get ready, your letters of recommendation, contact your school, make sure everything is you know, moving as quickly as possible so that by the day that that application uh, our portal opens, you can put your application in and you, you're, all, you're more likely than not to get noticed, to get seen, and then considered for interviews, even though they're still going to use several, you know, parameters to to uh, adjust whoever they give an interview interview slot. So please be mindful of that. Get in contact with your school. Get in contact with whoever is going to write letter of recommendation for you. Let them know before the middle of August. Thankfully, for this season, the period has been extended. Uh, to to October 21 because they anticipate there's going to be a lot of issues um, re, uh, for people to get all of their papers in. Okay, the meeting's come to an end. I, listen, I appreciate all of you guys for stopping by. I, I'm going to try to do a lot more of these things. More now, I'll try to veer a little bit more into actual, actual medicine for, for people in residency or for people practicing in any other parts of the world or for people just interested in understanding or learning about medicine um, I'll, I'll be having a session on, on Thursday on IV fluids. I think it will benefit everyone who's listening, any physician who's coming to listen, whether you're practicing or not, whether you're practicing in the U.S. or practice somewhere else, it will definitely benefit you. So I, I, I'll appreciate if you guys stop by. Okay, I, listen, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll see you guys on Thursday, God willing. All the best, and I, I pray, you know, this March season goes very well for you, better than you expected, all right? Take care, people.